Dragons of Autumn Twilight is a book that ended with the refugees from Pax Tharkis having found a refuge in the mountain pass in the hopes of well, possibly making it through the winter. Now, if you read the Dragonlance Chronicles back in the day, or are reading it now, or at any time for that matter, you know, or have discovered that in between books one and two, there's a jump, a big jump, with the heroes of the lands having gone on another adventure and brought the refugees to the dwarven city of Pax Tharkis. Now, at which point you're probably going, wait, um... We were fine over there before. Why are we over here now? And how did we get here? I, this is These are things I want to know. Now, if you've been playing the role-playing game modules along with the reading the books or what have you, you'd know because you would have gone through this story through a couple of different adve adventures. Because while most or much of the Dragonlance modules were adapted into the original Chronicles series, not all of them were and the adventures that cover that gap were among those that were skipped over. The events were acknowledged and still happened, but they were skipped. Now, in the late 2000s, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman returned to Dragonlance to adapt this missing chapter, or two chapters, because it's two modules, into novel form. It is to the credit of Weiss and Hickman that after so long an absence from all the original heroes of the lands, like the, the entire group of characters, including ones who get killed off before the end of the series, they, it feels like Weiss and Hickman are so able to so effortlessly find, effortlessly find their voices. And at this point in these characters' lives, after all this time, there are some stumbles. It, but it, it's still rather impressive. Probably the most notable stumble is Sturm. He, over the course of the book, tap dances on the raggedy edge of an alignment violation um, that he is goaded into by Raceland, a person who he trusts, who he does not trust as far as he can throw him, because he can throw Raceland pretty far, since he's a mage, and he's also rather emaciated. But the, it feels off for him. But, on the other hand, the story does give the spotlight to some characters who I feel really get short shrift in the novels. Most significantly, Flint Fireforge. In the novels... Not much time is spent on Dwarven society, and especially not on definitely not on Flint's backstory. Um, this book, on the other hand, explores Flint's background much further, how Dwarven society is structured, and how Dwarven society reacted to the events of the Cataclysm. Considering that, very early on in Dragons of Winter Night, a huge deal is made in Tarsus that the party is able to pass through Thorbarden, it's kind of important to get across here why it is such a big deal that they're able to do this. There are some additional character development for Raceland here, which both sets up material that I believe will pay off in the Chronicles series, but also during the Legends series as well. Of not exactly equal importance, but still somewhat notable, is some brief development to get for Tika, but that stuff's handled in a, in a very mediocre faction. On the one hand, she, on her own volition, follows off after Karaman. Um, Tass ends up following her, but it's more Tass choosing to follow her rather than her insisting Tass come along, because no one insists Tass come with them anywhere. Um, nobody wants to be followed by Tass. And again, she kills him the first time, and she's showing a tremendous degree of character agency and independent action here for doing all this stuff. On the other hand... Her arc exists entirely in the attempt to get the affections of a male character, and the attack by a draconian against her, the, the first thing she kills, is written like an attempted rape, to enough, enough of a degree that I could see giving a content advisory on this. Tika needs to metaphorically and mechanically level up in the narrative, but I'd say it never really feels like it happens here. I also listened to the audiobook of this, and the book audiobook is something of a mixed bag. The reader, Sandra Burr, nails Tass and Flint to a tremendous degree. It's be spot on perfect, both in terms of their voices and their character dynamic. And she also gets Raceland incredibly well. <clears throat> However, the performance for Karaman suffers. He, her rendition of him makes him feel more like a big dumb oaf 
than what the character actually is. Karaman is, in the books, someone who's closer to Gowrie from Slayers, a person who is book dumb, but street smart. He can't necessarily, like, he can't keep up with his brother on the knowledge front, on the academic front. Um, but you, but it could probably set up an ambush pretty much anywhere you want it to, or create a, as good a defensive position as can be created with the resources at his disposal. Um, he, like, he, he's knowledgeable about more practical stuff, probably even to an extent that Raceland isn't, but it's the the book learning things where he runs into problems. Um, but Bird doesn't quite get that dynamic. He's clo uh, her version of him is closer. This is going to be a deep cut. If you if you're ever familiar with Writer's Radio Theater, um, the character of Charlie, the three hundred pound doofus who is the sidekick of the villain Slocum, that is kind of what Gowrie is closer to. But boy, that's a deep cut that I don't think anyone's going to get, but anyway. Still, I did like the story, and I mean, I spent an audible credit on this, and it feels like a reasonable purchase. Um, it's a book that exists to fill a narrative hole that was addressed in the adventure novels, but not in the book trilogy, and it's a narrative hole that I think is filled well. Um, it's if you are into the Dragonlance series, it is definitely worth picking up. If you like read the Chronicles all throughout middle school or high school or whatever, it's fun to go back to these characters at this time in their lives. If you're going through the Dragonlance Chronicles now and you saw and you started on uh, Dragons of Winter Night. And had that's way, wait a minute, we were over here, what happened? It is perfectly acceptable. In fact, it, it doesn't hurt anything to put that book down, pick up Dragons of the Dwar Dragons of Dwarven Deaths, and go, okay, here's what happened. Um, and even to an extent, because this, these adventures in the sort of proto-adventure path happened, um, it is it is one of those rare cases where the like Dragons of Winter Night calls back to stuff that is in this book, even though this book hadn't been written yet, because it's calling back to stuff from the modules, done as fan service to people who were re who were reading the books at the time and who also had played the adventures, um, the adventure modules for Dungeons and Dragons. So that is enough of a thing, which I think if you're going through Again, the Dragonlance um, series now, particularly since, I mean, the adventures are out there in PDF on, on DM's Guild. But if you haven't picked those up, or don't want to pick those up necessarily, you just want to read, you don't want to read a book, not read an adventure module, this is a good way to enjoy that story as well. Next, um, next time this month, because this is, um, I should be able to mention this to start of the show. Um, this is August. This is the month of Gen Con, the best four days of gaming. Uh, I will, will, as with last month, be continuing with the tabletop role-playing licensed fiction with the first Dungeons & Dragons novel, one from a legend of speculative fiction, Andre Norton, and Quag Keep. That'll be in two weeks. Catch you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.